Hello, good morning everyone, and good afternoon, depending on your time zone. So my name is Kevin LaDuke, and I will be your host for the Lightning Talks today. And the Lightning Talks are a chance for people in the engineering team to showcase a goal that they just reached or a significant milestone in their project. And uh, next week is the end of the quarter, so I suspect a lot of teams have goals that they've reached so far. And uh, also at the end, we also leave the opportunity for uh, community members to also showcase uh, what they've been working on. So the way this will work is we'll have 10 minutes per talk. And it's a hard cap, so everyone has a chance to go. Um, when there are two minutes left, Megan will speak into the microphone and say two minutes, and then give a one minute working. And then after 10 minutes, I cut you off. So um, uh, it's up to the presenter to leave time for questions at the end. When they ask for questions, uh, if you're in the audience, please use the microphone over there. Um, otherwise, I will also be monitoring Wikitech, um, the Wikimedia-Tech channel on IRC. So without further ado, let's have our first lightning talk, which is local, Morial. Hello. Ooh, that's loud. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk to you about Echo and um, what we did about splitting notifications. So in case you don't know and you haven't used it ever, um, this, oops, what happened? What's going on? This is not Echo. Does this count against my 10 minutes? OK, thank you. All right. This is Echo. Thank you. So uh, up until now, the, uh, the current behavior that we had was um, we had a little marker um, telling us that there's some notification. In this case, it's a red notification. Red as in I've read it before and not read the color. It's going to get confusing a little bit. So, um, And then if I open it up, um, I see a pop-up that gives me messages and alerts. So this is what it looks like when I actually have unread notifications. Um, and then I can, so it's red now, red the color. Um, and I can, and I have two notifications. So I click and I get the um, pop-up. And I actually had one alert and one message. And it's really kind of difficult to figure out in advance if I have the number two, how many alerts and how many messages I had um, until I open it up. So. There were a couple of issues with the um, current behavior. First of all, having one counter for both the alerts and messages can be a little confusing. Um, we don't know in advance what it, you know, if, if we have alerts or messages, like I said. And the fact that then we open the uh, pop-up, the, they are marked as red. So we're kind of losing the context of what notification we were looking for. Um, there's an overuse of the red color or the red button. Um, we may have just a message on our talk page or on some conversation that we're part of, and it might not be urgent, and yet it will fly out as a red color. So that's another thing that we wanted to fix. Um, and it's not using OGS UI. And with that, what I mean is that we're really losing out on existing features in a library that is supported. And when we, we're not using that library, we need to do a lot of things that are you know, continued maintenance and support. So out with the old and on with the new. So this is the new Echo. Yay. Um, so what we have here is what happens to new users. So new users that don't have messages yet will really see about the same initial behavior. Um, we have an alert here. so. This is test user 12 who has an alert. When they open it up, they see welcome to uh, DevWiki. Um, and since they don't have any messages yet, they don't see the messages button. But the minute that they have a message, we're going to have another button on top that tells them that now they have messages. So now it's easier to see that you have one alert. It's a red alert. Um, and two messages. And it's not as you know, obtuse as the red alert in your face. And you can open them, each one separately, 
and decide if you want to read both or just one. And the numbers uh, make more sense, too, because now you know for sure you have two messages and one alert and not three and very vague result. Um, so the actual improvements that we did was the clear, immediate indication. Um, we're using OJS UI now. We can use all the advantages of that. Um, we're lazy loading the pop-up UI, um, which means we're having a little bit better performance right now. So uh, nothing loads. So uh, on when the page loads, uh, nothing of the system actually loads until you click the button. Only when you click the button, the entire pop-up system and OUI, all that kind of stuff loads. Um, and this also allowed us to do a lot of preparation, uh, background uh, preparation for cross-wiki notification and some other really cool features that are being talked about. Um, so this is a cool image that I took from the signpost uh, for last week. So they ran a survey asking um, what do you like more, the old system of Echo or the new system with split notification? And 70% said they like the new system, which is pretty cool. Uh, so what's next for Echo? Well, we're working on uh, cross-wiki notifications. We're thinking about, emphasize on thinking about, uh, real-time push notifications. Um, we're talking about controlling notification volume, maybe clustering notifications by type, and uh, improving behavior on mobile. All of these, feel free to join the tickets and look at the discussions and the discussions. And of course, uh, your features, suggestions are welcome. These are just images of some of the ideas that we have. They're really preliminary, uh, no promises, but uh, this is like the first step we're kind of thinking about going with you know, the future effect. Questions? Yes. Please go to the mic. Thank you. Um, last slide was was up for three seconds. So, uh, am I correct if assuming this is like global notifications, cross wiki notifications? Yes. Is that possible? It might be. We're working on that. That's exactly what we're we're working on. Uh, that's exactly what we're thinking about, um, and that was part of the of splitting notification was in preparation for for that. We'd we'll love to see that, by the way. Hi. Um, so I saw the split notifications for a few days, and then they vanished. So what happened? I was waiting for that question, actually. Um, I was actually thinking if I should put it in the in the lecture or not, and I've decided that it's out of scope, but I, I will absolutely answer it. So what happens is that we um, had Echo ready with split notifications, and we pushed it, um, and it was live. And then we found a couple of bugs um, that required us to pull it. So there were two main issues that resulted in us reverting Echo and working more. One of them was a bug in comments. Um, I can explain a little bit what happened, but I think Roan can probably explain a lot more. So what happened, do you, you want to explain? For, so that was one, and the other one was, um, was uh, OK, explain about the, that bug. So I predicted about a year ago that Safari was going to be the new Internet Explorer. And after last week, a lot of people have been telling me that I was right. Um, basically, Safari is a piece of garbage, and nobody should use it. But unfortunately, some people do. And because somebody did something silly on Commons about two and a half years ago, um, we were not showing search suggestions to anybody on Commons when they were logged in. Um, but nobody noticed until Elena looked at Commons for like three minutes in, in as far as that out. Um, and that also completely broke the new ecosystem, made Commons essentially usable if you were logged in and using Safari, which was you know, good enough reason to use it back in. And so this uh, th that was the one, and the second one was um, uh, regression and uh, performance. But both of those things kind of showed us that, um, I mean, this is the first time that a really big feature for all logged in users is loading OUI. So a lot of it was us finding out that this is what's going on. We need to kind of adjust the code. We need to adjust our strategy. And we found code that actually was live on comments for a while. And Nobody noticed because whatever you was using it was really small. 
Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Hi, are you going to um, have you thought about um, integrating the? I think it's called the orange bar of doom. The the orange thing that's next to it, which I think I think represents somebody on your talk page. So you, sometimes you can have like red and blue and orange. Have you thought about sort of combining that, or will that still remain a separate sort of bar? For now, it remain, remains separate. They also have uh, two kind of different. Um, points. The orange bar tells you that you have a, speci uh, a new message on your page, and uh, the blue pop-up uh, might mean that you have messages anywhere. Um, I'm not sure what happens in the future. Right now, it stays separate. Thanks. Any more questions? No. I received. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you very much, Morial. Next up is, well, all our next ones are remote. So Marcel will be presenting about event logging. Hi, hey, Marcel. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Marcel Reforms. I'm a developer in the analytics team. And let me share my screen so you can see the slides. OK, so I'm going to talk about event logging data retention audit. That is a project led by the analytics team. Uh, and this project, oh, sorry. Yeah. So this project has been based on two documents. One of them is WMF's privacy policy, and the other one is WMF's data retention guidelines. Those two documents uh, explain the following. So define what should we consider sensitive data in our databases, and also for how long we can keep that data in our private databases. Okay. Uh, the latter document, the data retention guidelines, also possesses a paragraph named audits for existing systems that states a commitment from WMF to audit uh, systems that have been there for a long time, even older than the data retention guidelines, uh, audit them to improve their sanitizing and uh, purging strategies. So that's that's the motivation of this project. Audit this uh, this event logging system. Okay, so for those who don't know event logging, uh, event logging is a platform for logging and processing uh, structured analytic data coming from media wiki sites like Wikipedia. Uh, so imagine we want to store, we want to know um, which images are being visualized in Wikipedia, OK? Uh, looking at the diagram, top left, we have Bob, our user. He is browsing Wikipedia. And every time uh, he clicks on an image and visualizes it, event logging client sends an event to the server, and the server uh, matches it against the schema, validates it, and if everything goes well, the event is stored in the private database. Cool. And to do that, event logging needs schemas. Schemas declare, define what we want to store, right, and also give a format to the event. In our case, for example, we have a username, which is the username of the user visualizing the image as a string, uh, the image title of the image being visualized, also a string, and the timestamp which is a number. And below that, there's an example of event for our case, right? Username equals Bob. Image title is fluffy dog, yes. And the timestamp, just a random number. OK, so now I'm going to explain the steps that we followed for this audit. First one was collecting the status of all schemas. Um, event logging has uh, nearly 200 tables in the database. Uh, distributed among 170 schemas, more or less. So we went through all of them and collected following information. Uh, the maintainer or owner, who is a goat person for notifications, alerts, uh, questions. Uh, also the team and the project the schema belong to. And all, finally the status, which means if the schema is receiving the events uh, as of today or not, or the, or the schema is being developed, etc. 
And all this information is published in the top pages of every schema. So you know the schemas are persisted in wiki pages. So you can visit their top pages and have a look at those data. Second step was uh, going through all schemas again and looking for sensitive structures, OK? Uh, so sensitive structures, in our case, are composed by two things. First one is a user account identifier. This is a piece of information that identifies uniquely a user account. And for example, username, that's a, that's a user account identifier, also user ID. In some cases, for example, edit count is also an identifier. And second piece of information is uh, related sensitive information. Uh, so this would be information that expresses uh, concepts like uh, uh, religion, sexual orientation, familial status, um, health status, etc. Right? In our case, we don't we don't store this data, but we store browsing patterns, and browsing patterns may be sometimes indicators of those concepts. In our case, fluffy dog. Right? Cool. So. The dangerous part of it, the potentially harmful part, is the association between the two. If we associate Bob with a fluffy dog, we get some sensitive structure. And the data retention guidelines tells us we should remove, uh, break those structures after 90 days, right? So either delete Bob, either delete fluffy dog, or both works too. And that's what we want to do. So after identifying all uh, sensitive structures and all schemas, we contacted the schema owners. Uh, by the way, there were like, I think, around 20, uh, 30 schema owners, and proposed them with uh, strategies to auto purge uh, their data, depending on the severity of their schemas. And after some discussions, we agreed on three uh, purging strategies. The most, uh, for, for most sensitive schemas, uh, we will implement a full purge, which will delete uh, the whole schema after 90 days, OK? This also works for schemas that don't need their data being kept. And actually, the majority of the schemas will have this uh, full purging. For schemas that are sensitive but also contain non-sensitive data that is worth being kept, uh, we implement a partial purge, we'll, which uh, assigns some of those values, the sensitive values, to a garbage value and leaves the rest to be kept indefinitely. And for not sensitive schemas, we will keep all data indefinitely. OK. Uh, the fourth part of the audit is, uh, is activating the auto purging. This is still a to-do. We're implementing it, and it will happen start of key two. We will not know the schema owners when exactly. OK. So here's a list of links of interest, uh, including the documents I mentioned, and also some documentation on Wikitech, and the list of schemas. Uh, I want to thank Madhu for working together with me in this project, uh, Kevin Lutyuk, Chris Type, Jaime Crespo, and all schema owners for uh, long and productive discussions. Thanks. Any questions? All right, I have a question. Um, you briefly mentioned the edit count. And can you tell us a little bit more about how edit count is actually potentially identifying and how it was handled? Sure. So edit count is the number of edits a user uh, has done, right? And the majority of cases, this is not sensitive because it's just a number among many. But for some very special users that have uh, edited a lot, this number may be very high and may be identifying because uh, very few users may have a number of 5,422 edits, for example. So this field may be sometimes used as identifier. What has been done? Um, for new schemas coming to event logging, this field uh, is either going to be fully purged after 90 days or not permitted. And for older schemas that already have this field, we are bucketizing it. So we're transforming the numerical value into a categorized value, like zero edits, 
from 1 to 4 edits, from 5 to 99 edits, from 100 to 999 edits, and more than 1,000 edits. So you can still query for uh, interesting uh, insights using this uh, categorized field, but we have a sanitized field that is not sensitive. Two minutes. Um, so um, I understand the concerns around privacy, ID base limits. Uh, um, but me as a researcher, and I think a lot of researchers would agree that having data over only three months might not be as reliable as you might think. And um, having just monitoring the patterns over a long period of time uh, might be more useful than having it over a short period of time. Um, so my question here would be, is it absolutely necessary to delete or purge the data or could it be a solution that anonymizing uh, usernames by placing them with really arbitrary um, usernames that make unaccountable uh, would be a good solution to maintain privacy as well as uh, provide more data for research? Thank you. That's a good question. So first, make clear that uh, especially lots of schemas that the research team is using are not being purged, not even not fully auto purged, not even partially auto purged because they do not contain sensitive structures. And in the case they contain them, uh, the minimum purging is being done to ensure that those structures are not potentially harmful. For example, you're right, uh, purging the username. Uh, yes, it would be interesting to know if uh, changing the name, sanitizing it, and conserving the analytical properties of it would be a path. But right now, that needs to be researched, and uh, we're not implementing this. But it may be a good idea. One minute. I'm going to step in and just say, if that's the case with one of your schemas, talk to us. And we'll figure something out. Sure. Cool. All right. Thank you, Marcel. Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks. All right. Next up, Frédéric Bolzuc will talk about graph editing in Visual Editor. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me and see me just right? Yes, we can. OK, great. Um, uh, hello. First of all, I'm impressed you you pronounced my name correctly. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm a Google Summer of Code student, and I've been working this summer on uh, graph editing and visual editor. So I'm going to be talking about that. You guys, I'm going to share my screen. Here. OK. So. Yeah, so um, this is a module I've been working on that is a subset of the existing graph extension. Uh, what's the graph extension for? Basically, it, uh, it's powered by a third-party library that is called Vega, which, um, which enables graphs, maps, and other visualizations to be uh, rendered on the browsers. Um, yeah, and, uh, and what, how Vega works is that they take, um, it takes a specification in the form of a JSON, string and renders it into either a HTML5 canvas or an SVG. And uh, we have a Graphoid service that uses that uh, HTML5 canvas or SVG to render a static file in order to, in order to, um, to serve older browsers as well as newer browsers. So that's all well and fine, but the problem is that in its current state, the graph, the graph extension doesn't, doesn't support Visual Editor. So uh, users have to go into view the, the source uh, wiki text editor to uh, enter those JSON specifications to make graphs and visualizations, which is a problem, because who wants to edit source anyway? <laughs> so um, also, Vega gives total control, uh, as in too much control over the output and styling, because there are uh, a lot of different setups and different configurations that you can use for, uh, for your graphs, and you can control anything, or, and uh, there is not really that much of a documentation for it, 
So it's really a hassle for the average user to use Vega uh, only by the, the JSON spec. And even basic specifications will still remain terrifying things for the average user. I will show you one just here. It's really small because I had to zoom out a lot, but it's 95 of JSON just for this simple graph right here, which is only four points of data uh, and uh, with a color and with a fill. And it's 95 lines already, so you can easily see why it's not really workable uh, for the average user in the wiki text. So um, also another problem here is that basic operations aren't, aren't as straightforward as they seem even for developers. This is something I figured out uh, over the summer is, uh, for example, if we try to switch a graph from a line graph to a bar graph right here, which is uh, the example is right here, you don't you don't really have this type of pr uh, property to just switch from line to bar. It's not really that simple. You have to change the mark type from area to rect, and then you have to change the properties of the mark from interpolate value monotone, which uh, makes the little lerp here, to undefine, and then define the width of the mark to like have this nice little band here, which is why band is true, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to change the scale, the scale to work ordinal to have like 0, 1, 2, and 3 at the end, uh, on the y-axis here instead of like floating points for the area graph. So it's really difficult to make simple modifications, which is where the module comes in. So it conditionally loads if V is detected on your, on your existing installation. So you really have nothing to do if, um, if V is already installed and graph is already installed. We'll have the V support. In, um, in your browser, and renders Vega graphs and graph node as graph nodes within VE because it was considered, graphs were considered alien extension nodes before, so we have this new graph node that uh, displays graphs correctly in the, in the visual editor, and it also adds, which is the big part, it also adds a graph editing dialog in VE. So what does this dialog look like? Basically, um, uh, you, now you can easily switch between an area, a bar, and a line graph. Those are the three graph types that are, um, that are supported right now by the, the dialog. Others will come soon, uh, but for right now, these are the basic ones. And soon, uh, I, I say soon because uh, I discovered after making this slide that the padding isn't actually in production just yet. It hasn't been merged, but it's really close to, so uh, I'm just going to touch a word about it here, so you can edit the padding around your graph, which is going to become useful when you work with big numbers in your y, x, and y axes, because uh, when the, long, the number is really, really long, it tends to, to uh, overflow beyond the, the padding limit of the graph, so you, can, will, you will have to work with, will have this tool to work with. Um, you can also edit the graph data, add and really delete rows of data, which is uh, the basic thing you want to do in a, in a graph. This comes with a custom-made table widget that I used that I developed for, uh, for this project. Uh, it's potentially usable in OGS UI core. It's not, um, it, it's not really on the table uh, formally just yet, but it's been talked about. It's been talked about. Basically, it's a, t it's a, it's a widget that, um, that, makes, uh, tables, um, that makes tables easy to work with in, the, in UIs uh, in OGS. Also, uh, we have this uh, raw mode here that uh, displays the original specs. This syncs automatically with changes made elsewhere in the dialog. So if you change the data, if you change the padding or the graph type, it will automatically propagate the changes in this box here, which displays the raw JSON specification of the graph you're working with. This is not intended to remain a final feature in the dialog because it kind of defeats the purpose to have a UI in the first place. But since Vega is a, is a big beast and have lot, has lots and lots of uh, different configs that you can use, we figured it might be a good idea for the meantime, in the meantime to have this text box in which advanced users can go and edit stuff they, they want to see in their graph before they apply the changes and still be able to use the UI instead of having to go in the wiki text dialog and the wiki text editor as well as the visual editor. And of course, many, many other features will uh, Will uh, will come in the in the future for this uh, editor because I'm not done with it. <laughs> so uh, who knows what's next? So thank you, and uh, now it's question time. Right, I have a question from IRC. Okay, from uh, Millimetric. This is really sweet. Have you all looked at Vega Lite as an alternative source or intermediary? 
Uh, you're talking about the official Vega UI, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, yeah, we've talked about it. Uh, it's been a it's been a concern for us uh, throughout the summer, and we figured out it's um, it's probably not a good idea to um, to include third party UIs into a Visual Editor to not interfere with the coherence of the the global UI guidelines and design guidelines. But it might be a good idea to uh, replace, eventually, the raw data section of the UI for this uh, official Vega UI to have uh, more features into. And then as we, um, as we decide uh, which feature we want to have in our uh, custom Vega editor, we'll uh, include them gradually into our editor and leave the, the official one as an advanced mode. Uh, hi, that's really cool. Um, in a little use of this stuff, in often what you wind up doing is you kind of want to have a uh, template where you just sort of, like for example, uh, Rachel Farron had a survey for um, uh, where people asked a bunch of, you know, how do you rate this zero through five? So what, with that, what you want to what you want to end up doing is sort of have a uh, template which um, sort of feeds the numbers and maybe some some values to the uh, graph tag, and then you sort of customize it for each turn. And um, the graph tag supports that, but then I assume that you know this extension um, has hard. Is, is it able to figure out what you're trying to do in that case where you're, you're uh, trying to create a template that has a graph tag in it? Yeah, uh, so uh, right now it, uh, the extension doesn't support, the, the module doesn't support the templates, but it's definitely something I want to do in the future. Uh, but I figured I would wait until um, the feature to add a new graph to the page was implemented first in the visual editor, because right now all you can do with the module is edit an existing graph. And it will not work if you have any data inside your graph that is feed, uh, that is fed from uh, an external source. That's something I want to figure out. But uh, yeah, I definitely definitely would like to have like this um, predefined template feature, which you can like pick the type of your graph you want to add, and it adds like uh, some uh, default data, and uh, then you can play with them, and customize them. Uh, am I answering your question right? Um, yeah, I mean it's great. I mean, it seems incredibly hard because you're sort of combining um, trying to design a template, filling in a template, so specifying yeah. parameters. But awesome that you're you're trying to solve it. And I think even without that, this is still really useful because at least it let you kind of play around and get the graph you want. And then, yeah. uh, you know, if you're somewhat expert, you could figure out how to how to in turn make a template that calls the graph. But um, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Let's have a round of applause for uh, Frederick. All right. Thank you. Up next is Stas with an update on the Wikidata query service. Thanks. Yes. So uh, uh, this presentation is a kind of a continuation of the presentation I gave. Uh, uh, some uh, time ago uh, already, so if you saw that one, uh, there would be some things that you already know, but uh, in case uh, not everybody knows that, I'll uh, still uh, go uh, from the start. So basically, uh, let's uh, talk first about what uh, Wikidata Query Service is and why, why we need it, and then uh, we'll talk about how we can use database of the free knowledge. Uh, and uh, the databases usually have query interfaces that uh, uh, that allow you to uh, basically query them. So okay, so I, I see that there are some, some connection problems.
Okay, so I'll stop and uh, wait for the connection problem. Okay, I think we are back in business. Yes, just a sec. We don't have you on screen yet. There we go. We're back in business. Okay. So, uh, and uh, you can see the slides, right? Yes, we see them. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's go. Uh, so basically, we have this uh, wonderful uh, database in uh, Wikidata with uh, over 14 million data items. And uh, the challenge is how we make sense out of it. And uh, more importantly, how we let the users make sense out of it by asking the questions that basically we cannot foresee or foretell and letting the users to formulate their questions. So that's, that's the goal of the uh, query service project to enable the users to ask Wikidata complex questions. Well, do we have a problem again? No, I think. No, we're still here. Still here. OK, sorry. Uh, OK, so, so how Wikidata Query Services uh, service does that? It uses the uh, structured query language called Sparkle to formulate the questions. And it has the Sparkle database behind to, to answer those questions. So for example, if we have a question uh, about Richard Feynman, we basically want to find uh, out uh, what people that worked with uh, Richard Feynman uh, did, uh, and specifically what physicists uh, uh, work, work, who worked with Richard Feynman did. Uh, so we would have a query like this. So for people that are not familiar with it, it kind of uh, can be a bit intimidating. But if you're familiar with, say, SQL, you can recognize a lot of similarity. And uh, uh, basically, uh, it uh, operates uh, with the entity uh, numbers and the property numbers that are in Wikidata uh, to um, to ask the question, and we will get an answer something like this. So these are the people that worked uh, with uh, Richard Feynman, and uh, these are the fields that uh, they worked in. So let's see. So this is uh, unlike the previous presentation that we just uh, showed the beta, beta. This runs in production. So uh, query.wikidata.org is the production site. And we can run uh, the queries there. Uh, for example, example queries, the largest cities with female mayors. So we can run the query. Uh, there is also download results. So if uh, so, you can edit the query, and when you're happy with the results, you can download them in in their various formats. And uh, that's a kind of the current state of the art with this interface that you basically can query and. Uh, uh, download it, and uh, next is what what next we can do with it. Uh, so we are thinking of how to basically how to extend this service to make it from just the query endpoint to really something that the users can benefit with. So some directions. Let's say uh, we want to to search for the list of United States president. So right now, if we search for it. We just get a number of articles. But uh, as we saw, basically, we actually can make a query that returns our, the actual list. So that would be pretty nice uh, to have the queries to return the actual list. How we can uh, do it? So fortunately, we have uh, services that um, 
allow you to do something that is almost like natural language search. It's still limited, uh, but it uh, allows some uh, a pretty wide range of queries to to work. It's based on the tool called uh, Platypus. So and it translates it to Sparkle. So for example, if we ask who is the mayor of San Francisco, it produces a Sparkle query. And if we run this Sparkle query, we, we see that we basically have the mayor of San Francisco. And if we say, like, what is the taxon name for Lama, we can see if we can see the taxon name for Lama. Yeah. So that's the apparently the taxon name for, for Lama. So that is a, lot, a wide range of questions that we can answer this way. And uh, we, so we have uh, basically right now we have this service working as a service. And it's uh, f fully functional and running and synchronized uh, with uh, Wikidata, usually within minutes so or within seconds even. So if you look at the, at the last updated, basically that's the data fresh up to pretty much uh, this minute. So you have the same data you have in Wikidata. And uh, the next thing we are looking at is uh, basically, uh, people to uh, suggest us what we can do with it and to build the services on top of it. And uh, for us to integrate this in our search and uh, discovery tools. So uh, the, uh, the service has the feedback link. So if you have any thoughts about uh, uh, what, how it works, what they can do, any suggestions, any complaints, just uh, click the link and uh, put uh, the feedback there, and uh, you can also write on the list or talk to us uh, on IRC. So that's that's uh, it for the Wikidata query service update. So any questions? I have a, a quick question. So sure. one interesting kind of question that people have ran using the Wikidata query service? Uh, like uh, uh, other, other uh, well, so there, there's a lot of uh, things that uh, people already do uh, with the research, but I, I don't have, uh, I don't have like uh, any things, uh, any links ready right now. Uh, so basically, it's it's very, very useful for like uh, uh, research, researching various questions, like I don't know uh, the what what I saw like no I I I don't remember right now. So I I, I don't have any any examples ready except for like uh, uh, I have some tools that I built for data quality. Uh, to kind of improve data quality on Wikidata that use already use a query service uh, for like finding uh, problems with the data and fixing them. Yeah, yeah. I was just curious because there's a lot of who worked with who, who was born with who, like associations. Yeah. Right? So, so there are there are such things. I just don't have uh, links on it. So if you look, uh, there is another uh, uh, another place on uh, Wikidata. Uh, there, there is a community uh, community page for Wikidata query service when people publish it. Uh, let me find. Hmm. One minute. Okay, so. I'll post it to IRC. I just don't don't have the the link now for for this page. I'll I'll post it to, to IRC. And please add it at the end of your slide so people can find it that way too. Okay, okay. I'll also add it to to the slides. Cool. All right. Thank you, Stas. Let's give him a round of applause.
Cool. So up next is someone who participated in the Google Summer of Code, Sumi. You're up. Hi, everyone. I'm Sumit. I participated in Google Summer of Code with MediaWiki for this year. And now I'm going to present to you Wikidata page when extension which I developed during the summer. So I'll just screen share it. See the background of the project was uh, mainly targeting wiki voice projects. Many wiki voice projects such as English and Russian ones use page wide banners at the start of every article. These banners are actually for adding visual and aesthetic appeals to the pages. The following link can um, provide detailed information. This is actually a sample of the banner on, a, on English wiki voice project. You can see that the banner is at the head of the article and it is quite wide. It also uh, displays the table of contents. So the issues that original banners were facing, which were rendered using an in wiki template, were the banners were actually not responsive, which caused a heavy load on mobile devices. Also, the banners were not compatible with extension while content, which was actually responsible for Wikimedia Mobile View. The banners were also not uniform across different wiki voice projects. This was basically because English wiki voice was using a different template, and Russian wiki voice was using a different template and French wiki voice is using a different different template to render the banners multiple table of con level table of contents were also not possible using the template with, uh, which restricted the editors to only show second level headings on the articles also the banner position was limited by use of template inside the main body okay, so may, may you, hang on a second the slides are not moving so we're not sure if we're moving. <laughs> are the slides static we just need the, the main slide. Just a second. There we go. And okay, now we see the slide. Okay. Can you see now? Yeah, it be working now. Okay. Now, what 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 all the extensions solved? The extension actually solved the large size of banners which were made responsive using the SASE set features of the browsers. Also, the table of contents now supports multiple level of articles uh, inside the article so that users can actually have uh, headings from three to six level. Also, different wiki voice projects uh, mainly I am referring to the English and Russian ones which have implemented the extension. In which which are using the extension have a uniform functionality now. Also, the banners support a new focus feature, which allows them to uh, focus on a certain part of the image, even when the image is too large. And now the extension is also having a better integration with mobile front end users. Here are, here are three use cases for the banner. The first one specifies the image name inside the banner and some options to display the banner. The second one actually displays the usage of the origin parameter, which is responsible for focusing the banner. Uh, we set origin is equal to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to set focus halfway right and downwards on the banner image. And the third one is uh, showing the use of an icon on the, on the banner. We specify an, a parameter icon star is equal to star article, which will refer to the star article and Yeah. I think you're still there. We still hear you. Or maybe not. Yeah, we don't hear you anymore. Assume it still don't hear you. Your background noise. Maybe we hear you now. Are we back now? Yeah, we can hear you now. 
Okay. It also actually supports uh, the use of icons or banners for adding visual qualifications. I'll just show you the example of the Agra banner. You can see the uh, UNESCO icon here on the Agra banner. It is actually being rendered using Wikidata page banner extension. And you can also see the multiple level table of contents which are being shown as drop downs, which was not possible before. It can support adding page title on banners, which is the uh, title with Agra here. It can also support horizontal table of contents on the banner, multi level especially, which are uh, a view, which are which can be seen as drop downs. And it is also highly customizable from EDFG common dot CSS, which the English Wiki Watch project is already already using to tailor to their needs, especially the small bullets after the table of contents, after the items. Now users, the extension was actually developed with a view of uh, with uh, targeting the English and uh, in targeting the wiki voice projects, but uh, due to its mobile compatibility, it is also being adopted by uh, to display banners on mobile. I'll just give you an example here. The dem this is a small demo of the banner used on mobile RTLs, which are uh, which, which are in a transition to use this extension to show their uh, mobile to show the banners on mobile. Thank you. Any questions? That's just going to ask you. Pardon? So, um, Yeah, I don't know if we can hear you or we can have a question, but uh, you can ask it on the as well. Um, panels. Yeah. yeah, I think we're having audio problems, so it sucks to end this video, but... Uh, can someone type the question on the IRC so that I can see because I'm having some audio problems here? Yeah. So uh, let's just let the conversation IRC and let's do a round of applause. Okay. So uh, we have one more surprise. The last minute presentation from Yuri, who will uh, talk about apps. Hi, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me well? Or am, are we having connection problems again? No, we hear you, but we see a black screen. That is not good. Oh, now we see your avatar. Oh, there we go. There. Better? Excellent. Yeah. All right, so some of you might have heard that uh, Discovery team has been working on maps, and we have successfully launched the experimental service. Let's call them beta maps. Uh, they're available at mapswikimedia.org. Everyone can play with them. And I'm going to do a very, very, very brief demonstration of what's going on. Well, first of all, let's share the screen. All right, so if you have any questions with uh, the maps, new map service, it's at mediawiki.org slash wiki slash maps. Uh, there's current status and all the information about it. Also, right here, you can suggest uh, and participate in the future plans. This is very important because we don't know exactly where we're going. Without community support, we don't know which way to steer. So please help us drive this thing. Uh, decide what features are needed and what's not. And this is what it looks like. I mean, here's San Francisco. We can zoom in, zoom out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
the map is very barren right now. We we try to create it is it as like limited as pale as small as non feature rich as possible so that it can be overlaid with stuff. Um, for our first target is Wiki Voyage. Wiki Voyage community has already started building some tests. Like for example, they built this nice little thing on top of our maps so you can see like little fun buildings to, to see on your voyage uh, as you walk around. They also built some test tools to compare our maps to other services. So that's what we have. The maps support uh, things like uh, static, uh, static images, where you can take a snapshot, uh, basically request an image of a, from certain coordinates of a certain zoom level and certain size. You can, uh, it supports retina or high DPI devices. It's vector-based, so in, in theory, we can very easily customize it for div different use cases and on the fly decide which features to show and which not, not to show, and possibly very soon or not soon. We do not know when exactly it will happen. Again, please participate in our future plans. Uh, we'll switch to WebGL rendering, so all the maps will actually render on the client side. They are very easy to edit. Uh, there is this really nice Mapbox Studio uh, classic uh, version, which allows anyone to connect it, to point it directly at our service at mapswikimedia.org and then say, oh, let's say I don't like the color of water. I mean, there's a lot of pollution, so let's like make it kind of greenish and save it. And uh, this, uh, like the water should really look more like this. No, not like that. Oh, there we go. It's kind of green. Um, so these kind of things, you can change the style of like fonts, colors of the roads, the width of the roads, anything you like. Uh, lastly, uh, well, that's pretty much it. So I'll turn off the presentation and we'll get the questions now. Hello. Stop sharing. There we go. Questions? Any questions? Um, so, I'll ask a question. Like, who who's using it right now? Uh, like, is this live on any uh, page on on Wikipedia? Wikipedia. Um, the the only we currently block it by refer header, which means we only allow any anyone from WMF Labs to use it and integrate it directly into uh, Labs instances and also Wiki Voyage. Since this has just launched, there's no very active users yet. But it has made the news. Actually, uh, there's a lot of you, uh, like uh, hacker news has uh, has had a huge discussion about this, and we had a huge spike in us users visiting it. Uh, Russian news media has picked it up. We had over 50 news sources reporting on this story. So uh, it's just been launched officially as of a week ago, I believe. So it hasn't really picked up the use cases. Wikipedia will be a bit further off because we need to ramp up the number of servers, varnish servers, caching servers, uh, to serve the bigger traffic. Cool, thank you. S has a question. Yeah, I have a question for the audience. What the hell is wrong with everyone else and they don't have any questions about this? But anyway, um, my question. Oh yeah, the the sorry, the mobile team is also working on integrating the, uh, this feature into their apps. So that might be a very good use case right there. I was kidding. I I, I I'm sorry. I'm asking so many questions. Um, so the right now on English Wikipedia articles, there's a I think there's a like a coordinates template or something, and that shows coordinates. And then when you click the coordinates, you go to some kind of a lab service that that just links to like a zillion things, and I don't think the um, wiki, our own map service is in there. So how do you see the um, like six months from now? What do you think will happen when somebody clicks on a coordinate in an English Wikipedia article? I'm not going to comment about the six months, but I do see clicking the coordinates opening up a full screen uh, maps uh, page. Uh, with the coordinates right there on the screen without taking you to labs. Um, and as an interim step, uh, step, that same thing will happen as part of the labs instance. That can also happen. Um, also, I see all sorts of interesting overlays going on top of the maps where uh, feature, oh, there's this thing called K 
LM, I believe. It's a way to integrate uh, GeoJSON directly into the Wikipedia articles. And basically, that data could be overlaid on top of this map dynamically so that the maps will be shown uh, to, the, uh, to our readers with all sorts of extra information, like, again, uh, the, I don't know, some uh, habitation locations or things like that for some animals. OK, thanks. And what, am I correct that right now, if you, when you click the coordinates and you go to that GeoHack page, you, um, it doesn't yet link to the cool map service yet? Um, it can be fairly easily changed, but we haven't poked at it yet, no. Our first goal is to try to get to work with the WikiVoyage community and try to build it uh, to, to make it work with them, as well as possibly other use cases where uh, volunteer developers come, uh, come in and decide to use it for various other amazingly crazy projects on the labs. OK, cool. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Yuri. Let's give him a round of applause. Cool. And this concludes our lightning talks. See you next month. <laughs>